Would the congregation please stand? may be seated. Welcome to the funeral service for Paul Frederick. We make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have come together to seek God's comfort in our sorrow and to rejoice in the promise of the resurrection. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ who said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. We pray. Lord Jesus, you wept at the grave of your friend Lazarus, and you consoled Mary and Martha in their distress. Draw near to us who mourn for Paul, and dry the tears of all who weep. Calm our troubled hearts, dispel our doubts and fears, and lead us to praise you for having brought him to faith. In your rising from the dead, you conquered death and opened the gates to eternal life. Strengthen us with your word and lead us through this earthly life until at last we are united with you and all the saints in glory everlasting. Amen. Psalm 23 is just one of those psalms that just seems like almost everybody knows that psalm and, and treasures that psalm. And in, in, in part, it's because it is the psalm that speaks to us in so many different times in our lives. And certainly it speaks to us at a time like this as we remember God's promises and truth as a good shepherd who comforts and guides us and uses all things for our good to lead us home to heaven. And so we take time to remember Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We continue with our sentences of resurrection comfort. The congregation is asked to respond with those lines as they're directed in our responsive reading. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. 
The Apostle Paul writes to the Romans, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus gives us this comfort. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then we also will appear with him in glory. We will be before the throne of God in day and night in his temple. Never again will we hunger. Never again will we thirst. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be our shepherd. He will lead us to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Let us pray. God of all grace, you sent your Son Jesus to destroy the power of death and to open the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Make us certain that because he lives, we too shall live. Comfort us with your promise that neither death nor life, nor things present nor things to come, shall be able to separate us from your love which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. We sing our first hymn. We join in singing Amazing Grace. We take time in our worship service to remember God's grace to Paul as we recount some of the high points of God and his blessings showered upon Paul. So we turn to pages 11 and 12 of our worship folder, the last page, for the Christian obituary of Paul Stuart Frederick. Paul Frederick was born on March 6th of 1944 in Manitowoc, son of the late Hugo and Selma or Sally Winkler Frederick. His God-fearing parents arranged for the baptism of their little boy a few weeks later, when on March 31st, he was born into God's family through holy baptism. Through this sacrament, our triune God connected Paul to his Savior through faith, as he placed his name on the head and into the heart of his precious child. God faithfully watched over his child throughout his life. 
He was confirmed on May 18th of 1958 and continued to develop his God-given abilities into adulthood. He graduated from Reedsville High School, the class of 1962. On October 6th of 1979, he married the former Vicki Van Asten at St. John St. James Lutheran Church in Reedsville. She preceded him in death on April 15th of 2006. Paul started his work career as a farmer and then went to Brilliant Ironworks, retiring in 2010. In his younger years, he enjoyed hunting, fishing on Lake Michigan, dartball, golfing, shooting pool, and gardening. In his later years, he enjoyed visiting with people and would be seen all around town. Paul was an avid Packers, Brewers, Badgers, and Panther fan and enjoyed watching the Reedsville football practices and games as a quote-unquote assistant coach. He also enjoyed his fur grandbabies, Ronnie, Charlie, Henry, and Macy. Paul was known to have a peppermint on the rocks, easy on the ice, after a meal. But most of all, he loved his grandchildren and spending time with them. In his infinite wisdom and grace, Paul's Savior Jesus called him into his loving arms this past Sunday, January 31st of 2021, at the age of 76 years, 10 months, and 25 days. He passed away at Aurora Aurora, Aurora Baycare Medical Center in Green Bay and was welcomed home to eternal life in heaven. Survivors include his children, Sherry and Annette, Scott and Tracy, Aaron and Amber, Bradley and Mara, and his grandchildren, Kylie and Tyler, Cameron and special friend Aubrey, Cassidy, Aubrey, and Tegan, his goddaughter, Tanny and Steve Blake, one sister, Faye Haney, and in-laws, Lee Van Asten, Alan and Paige Van Asten, Barb Van Asten, Bonnie Hofsberger, Deborah Harches, and Russ Rittenacker. Nieces, nephews, and other relatives and friends also survived. He was also preceded in death by his in-laws, Robert Haney, Keith Van Asten, Steve Harches, and Donna Rittenacker. Paul's soul has left us. His mortal remains will be interred at St. John St. James Church Cemetery. On the last day, bodies and souls will be reunited in a glorious new body, and believers of all time will be reunited with one another. While we as believers wait for this glorious reunion with our loved ones, the Lord comforts us with these words. Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. We turn our attention to the word first in John chapter 10. Our Lord Jesus speaks to us about being the good shepherd and us believers, his sheep. The confidence that we have as sheep is not in us in the way that we follow. In fact, the scriptures tell us we all, like sheep, have gone astray. We turn to our own way and we wander. The confidence that we have is in being the flock is in the shepherd. It's what makes us the sheep and gives us that confidence. For it's the shepherd that loved us enough to lay down his life for us and has the power that he can make the promise. Nothing can snatch us from his hand. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep, and I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Jesus answered, I, tell, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works I do in my father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So far the gospel of our Lord Jesus. We also turn our attention to the last book 
of the Bible. God gave the Apostle Paul the privilege of seeing a vision of what would come in these last days, and particularly a vision of heaven. Here in Romans, or Revelation chapter 7, he describes for us what heaven will be like for all those who are there. He describes those who are there as believers, robed in white, washed clean in the blood of Christ Jesus. And so he describes what it's like for believers who are, who are there now, like Paul, and like us, Lord willing, as believers who one day will also be there. Let's hear the description of heaven for us. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God singing amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever, amen. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they? Where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. He said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Our worship continues in singing about those great promises of God as we sing our next hymn, How Great Thou Art.
May God's grace and peace be yours in abundance through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. For our sermon today, we'll give our attention to Ephesians chapter 3, beginning with verse 12. In him, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, and so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Dear family and friends of Paul, We're going to take a cue from these words inspired by the Apostle, or by God for the Apostle Paul, as he writes these words, and in verse 14 in particular, he says, I kneel before the Father. And he says, it's for this reason that I kneel before the Father. And he's speaking about the words that were right before that, talking about his sufferings. It is suffering that often causes believers to kneel before the Father. It is moments like these that it's easy for us to understand what the Lord speaks about when he talks about suffering and trial and difficulty and why we kneel before the Father. I imagine in the last couple of weeks that Paul offered a few prayers. I imagine you did too. It is in those moments of suffering, those things where we are not in control, where if we could, we would change what's going on, that we find ourselves humbled and kneeling before the Father of all creation. God humbles us from time to time and reminds us things are beyond our control. And, And so whether it is a sickness that we wish would go away, whether it is a lump in our throat as we say goodbye and feel the loss of a loved one that we prefer would be here rather than gone, whether it would be masks that we're wearing and social distancing and all kinds of things that are beyond our control going on in this world, we are reminded in those things that we aren't in control, that we need help. And it is especially true for us as as sinners who recognize that we make mistakes, that we wish we could take things back. Sometimes we have regrets and feel guilty about things. And that too humbles us, and it brings us to a point of falling to our knees. Maybe not literally, but spiritually we kneel before God as sinners. And I imagine that Paul did some praying not only about getting well and sickness and being uncomfortable, but also about some of his regrets too. It is natural for every person when they face the reality of making, meeting their maker, their heavenly father, that as sinners they kneel before him humbly. Paul speaks to us and says these words, I kneel before the father, yes, as a sinner. But ultimately, Paul speaks to us about that and encourages us to do the same thing as believers. And so as believers, he says that, he he starts it this way. He says, in him, speaking of Christ Jesus our Lord, he says, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. And while our natural sense is one of fear, one of humility, one of feeling guilt and regret for for past mistakes and sins, God says we don't have to kneel before him and come as beggars and be afraid. 
He says, as believers, we kneel before the Father. As believers, through faith in Christ Jesus, we come with freedom and confidence. And so we don't have to come to the Heavenly Father in fear or in doubt but with an absolute confidence and freedom to come to him and ask anything that's on our heart and know that through faith in Christ Jesus, God hears and answers, and he answers in love. And sometimes the answer of love is hard to understand and see. When death is the answer, that's hard. And yet it's love. As a believer, we find comfort in knowing that, that even in that, there is relief, there is joy for the believer. And, and so you and I, as we're here, with our own suffering, with our own challenges, with our own hardships to deal with in this life, we too, as believers, have an invitation. One of our members, we had a, we had a funeral about a week ago, one of our members grabbed me and said, hey, did you hear? Paul Frederick is sick. I said, no. And we talked a little bit about that, and he grabbed me a couple days later on Sunday, and we made a plan. We said, I'm going to reach out to the family, you're going to reach out to the family, we're going to see if we can find out what's going on with Paul. And before we made any connections, the funeral home called and said, Paul's home in heaven. Since I've heard that, since I heard that Paul was sick, I've been praying for Paul, and I've been praying for you. It's what we do as Christians, it's as believers. We have the privilege of praying for each other. And it's what Paul talks to us about in this section of Scripture. That as believers, we have that privilege to do that, to pray for ourselves and for each other. So Paul says it this way. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. When we recognize there's hurt and there's loss. When we're humbled by the circumstances of life and there are things that we can't control or undo, God tells us there's one thing we can always do. As believers, we kneel before the Father. We go to Him in prayer. We ask for His wisdom and His power and strength through faith in Christ Jesus to find our way through. Because his promises, and we've heard that promise in the scripture lessons that we've read today, that we don't deal with anything alone. That Christ Jesus, the, the, the Lord that is our shepherd, leaves us with no wants because he's always with us, always by our side, always with his rod to comfort us and to protect us and to guide us. And so our cup always overflows. We always have blessings because as believers, God hears and answers our prayers. And in just in the right way, at just the right time, he gives us his strength to help us through the most difficult of things. And so we, like Paul, can say as believers, we kneel before the Father, first of all, in prayer. What a privilege that we have to be able to do that for ourselves and for each other. But God tells us there's another way that, we, that one day we're going to kneel before the Father. And maybe we do it now. There are those times that we are simply humbled and in awe of God and what he does. He describes God's love in this way. That we, he, the prayer is that our hearts might be strengthened through faith and knowing the love of Christ. And then he says the part of that prayer is that we as believers would know this love that surpasses knowledge. We actually sang about it in one of our hymns, one of the ones requested by y'all. How it strikes us when we think about how God sent his son to leave heaven and come here and offer his life for our sins, for our wrongs. when we really think this through, that God would do that. That God would go through that kind of excruciating pain, suffering and dying, being crucified on a cross for other people and their sin, not his own. It's hard to fathom. It surpasses knowledge. 
Truth be told, I probably could offer a few reasons why we might doubt whether Paul's in heaven or not. I don't know if it's a secret. You know him. That's why you're here. You know he wasn't an every Sunday churchgoer. We know that. We could offer reasons and go, oh, maybe God would do this or that, and I'm not sure if he's in heaven. But here's the thing. I don't have to preach about that. And you don't have to put your hope in that. Because it really doesn't matter. Every funeral that I get to preach at, I get to speak about the confidence of that believer being in heaven. Not because they were the perfect Christian or the perfect churchgoer, because the truth is I'm not the perfect churchgoer, and none of you are either. But that's grace. Because it isn't dependent, the scriptures tell us, it's not dependent on how well we've followed and how well we've listened as the sheep what it's dependent upon is the shepherd. And the Apostle Paul talks about this so clearly, so beautifully, with an absolute comfort for you and I. In just the page before this section of Scripture, he says it this way, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Our confidence in knowing where Paul is at and that Paul is at peace in heaven doesn't come from Paul's perfect walk of faith because he didn't have it and none of us do. And it's what astounds us by grace is that every time we sin, every time God has the right and should shake his head at us and be ashamed of who we are and that we would call him our heavenly father, God has every right to turn his back on each one of us and be done with us. But he doesn't. Time after time, sin after sin, mistake after mistake, regret after regret, we go to our God as believers and we kneel before him with our sin and we ask for forgiveness. And his love is boundless. When God speaks to us in this section of Scripture about his love, it's really grace, right? The, the definition of grace is God's undeserved love for sinners. And this is our comfort today. And it is our comfort every day that God does not treat anyone as they deserve, but treats all of his people in love. And so we are humbled and awed every day that God would still love us still call us as to his children, still listen to our prayers, still help us, and still lead us home to be with him in heaven. I don't know if any of you guys watch HGTV. If you like those shows of, and whether you like them or not, whether you watch them or not, we all know the concept, right? We know the concept of someone takes a home that needs to be renovated. And, and, and most of the time in those shows, they, the person who owns the house, they kind of kick them out for a while, and then they don't get to see what happens, and we as the viewers get to see all the changes and things that happen, and then the great reveal comes, right? That day when they finally get to see the house, and it's all new, and what do they do, right? The, the, you know it's about time, because the end, you're look, watching your watch going, okay, we got five minutes left, we know it's ready for them to start showing the house, and they're going to make it, right? That's all part of it. And then finally, the reveal, right? And they show it. And, and how does it go? One of the delightful things we get to watch is a family comes into this new home that's so changed and different, and they walk in, and they're in awe of how wonderful and beautiful it is and all the things that they've done. And then they go to the next room, and more awe and more charm and delight for them. And from room to room they go. And eventually, the budget has run out, and time in the show has run out, and the show closes. When I read this section of scripture, I often think about HGTV and that reveal and how it works. From one room to the next, eyes open and awed. God's prayer for us is that being rooted and established in love, that we may have the power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. 
that every moment of our lives, with every sin, with every trial, with every difficulty, with every moment of grief, that we would discover how wide and long and deep, that one room after another, one moment, one difficulty, one challenge, we would go, and where do we find, and what are we delighted in? God's grace. His boundless grace that never ends. What God has done and what he's changed in our world and in our lives never stops. The budget never runs out and time doesn't run out. We just go from one delight of God's grace to the next. As sinners, what an awe-inspiring thing to know that we'll never fully plumb the depths of how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ Jesus. This is the delight and the promise that God has for us here in this world. As long as we believe, as long as we kneel before our God and trust in Him and His promises. That's the promise of grace, of God's undeserved love. And so he finishes this thought with all these promises and saying this, now to Him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. These delights, this grace, and the things that we get to discover in the love of Christ go on forever and ever, from generation to generation to generation. And when God finally calls us home, we finally begin to really discover the things that he does that are immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine. Here we pray about heaven. Here we ask for relief. Here we ask for no more, no more tears or mourning or crying or pain. I'm not sure if you've ever noticed when God describes heaven, he mostly describes it as the ab absence of the things that we don't like here. Because the truth is, we can't really imagine or understand the delights that he's prepared for us in heaven. It is so different than anything we've ever experienced here that the only way that God can describe it is by saying, it, it's not the things that really stink. And so we're in awe. We kneel before the Father in prayer as we go through trials and difficulties as believers. And we know that as believers, one day we'll kneel before Him in awe. In awe of the grace and delights that He has in store for us. And it'll be an eternity upon an eternity and upon eternity of one delightful room after another, discovering how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. May God bless us as believers who kneel before the Father. Amen. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. We continue with our prayer of the church. Almighty God, we praise you for the great company of saints who finished their lives in faith and now rest from their labors. We remember especially our loved one Paul, whom you have redeemed by the blood of your son and received as your dear child through baptism. We thank you for giving him to us as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your compassion, comfort all who are sad in this hour. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We praise you for your love in Christ, which sustains us in this life and death. In our earthly sorrows, help us find strength in the fellowship of the church, joy in the forgiveness of sins, and hope in the resurrection to eternal life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You do not leave us comfortless, but strengthen and care for us through your word and sacrament. You give us family, friends, and neighbors to help when there's loneliness now and in the days to come. Brighten our future with a firm trust in your promises and care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. 
Amen. We join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We join in singing our final hymn, Ten Thousand Reasons. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. We are going to do the committal prayers here in church. The family is still going to go out to the graveside, but we're going to offer the prayers here in church. 
And so we can continue with uh, committal prayers. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. It has pleased Almighty God in his wisdom to take out of this world the soul of our departed brother. We now commit his body to its resting place, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. May God the Father who created this body, and may God the Son who by his blood redeemed this body together with the soul, and may God the Holy Spirit, who by holy baptism sanctified this body to be his temple, keep these remains to the day of the resurrection of all flesh. Amen. We pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have promised us forgiveness of sin and deliverance from eternal death. Strengthen us, we pray, by your Holy Spirit, that our trust in Christ Jesus may daily increase and that with sure confidence we may hold fast the blessed hope that we shall not die but only sleep and that the last day be raised to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us all. Amen. That concludes the committal night. We'll invite everyone to stand, to stand and the funeral directors to come forward at this time.